Welcome everybody to the ASAP2 webinar on business development. We're going to let people join uh, for a couple of minutes. While you're waiting, could you please put your name and your organization and country in the chat so we can know who's here? Thank you. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the ASAP2 webinar on business development. Um, we're going to wait two more minutes before we get started. Could you please put in, um, while you're waiting, could you please put in your name, your organization, and your country in the chat so we can see who's here and you can see who else has joined you. Thanks. And welcome everybody to the ASAP2 Zoom webinar on uh, business development. Um, we'll get started now. Uh, uh, let's welcome everybody. Um, if you could use a chat to Insert your name, your organization, and your country. We'd love to know who else is here. Um, we have the both the uh, chat box and the QA box open during the webinar. We ask that all questions only go into the QA box. That way we can monitor them and ask the presenters the questions. And you can use the chat box for answering questions asked by the presenters. We will have two polls during this webinar, so uh, they'll be launched and you'll be able to respond to them and we'll be able to see the scores. And all of our webinars, including today's, will be stored on the interhealth.org slash ASAP dash resources webinar uh, website. Uh, ASAP2 uh, has been extended and we are now ending on October 31st, 2024. ASAP2 built on ASAP1 with the purpose of helping local partners to become USAID prime partners. So understanding all the compliance requirements as well as being able to perform with PEPFAR funding and meeting the performance and reporting expectations. So far, we've worked in 18 countries. Here's a list of our countries currently and previously under ASAP2. 
Some of the key results is we've worked with 126 local organizations to help them build their capacity. Um, as I mentioned before, on our website, you'll be able to see all of the webinars posted. You can look at the search function to find the one that you are looking for. They are in English, French, and Portuguese, and we have 100 webinars posted there. For our upcoming webinars, I wanted to share this schedule with you. So today and tomorrow is English Business Development. We will have the same in French on the 16th and 18th. Um, on the 17th, we will be hosting um, with OHA and the Office of HIV AIDS at USAID, the PEPFAR expenditure reporting requirements. And then on the 19th, we will be hosting the human resources for health reporting requirements. These are very detailed, complicated reports. We encourage all local partners to attend this to get the instructions. Um, on ASAP, uh, I mean, on September 24th, we'll have our English closeout, where we'll be releasing the path to prime and road to sustainability. On the 25th, the Portuguese, and on September 26th, the French closeout meeting. So I wanted to share a little bit about path to prime. So we've created a document which um, encapsulates all of the capacities work with all of the local partners. So it's a compendium of resources for uh, localization. And in it, we have all of USAID's rules and regulations, technical policies, links to all of our training webinars, all the local partner meetings and templates for each of the uh, domains, the, the uh, technical areas where we supported local partners. Um, the current version uh, is will be released this month, not August. And for each topic, you'll find that the section includes um, policies, training materials, webinars, resources, and templates. So for the templates, we literally have several hundred templates for local organizations to download and to um, adapt as they need. So we have a board of director charter, we have a charter of accounts, we have a gender equity policy, we have everything that the capacity advisors have supported in a template form for local organizations to download and to adapt as needed. Uh, we also have all of the USAID policies. So these are all the, on the right are all the policies that, um, sorry, these are all the trainings from uh, work with USAID, so we have links to those trainings. But having said that, we also have all the policies that we that you say it expects organizations to comply with. We have our new best tool, which is our baseline and reassessment organizational assessment tool. We've updated it to the 2.1 um, and includes the self-assessments and reassessments and includes USAID's new NUPIS, which has 60 questions the previous 128. So again, this document includes all of these organizational templates. Um, you can download them and adapt them. They are translated into French, Portuguese, Amharic, Somali, Swahili, and Hausa. So we really spend a lot of time uh, finalizing our project closeout by summarizing everything, translating them to make them accessible. Um, on the bottom right-hand side, these are the, all the policies I mentioned before that USAID expects local partners to comply with. We have the direct uh, links to all the compliance requirements and then webinars and list of tools. So we're really excited to be launching this and leaving, um, closing out ASAP2 with this resource, which will be uh, held live on our website and updated um, as uh, changes occur in these uh, policy domain areas. With that, let me say thank you very much. And let me turn it over to Rebecca, who's going to do a great training on um, business development. Rebecca has been with us before. She's uh, conducted this training in person and virtually, and we're really excited to have Rebecca come back and provide this training. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate that. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. And hopefully, we'll be able to see it all fine. Let's 
sorry, I'm just trying to find my other one. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. So today I'm going to, um, it's kind of a webinar slash training. We have a lot of participants today and we're all glad to have you here. Um, and so we're going to be talking about, um, you know, business development and especially funding opportunities from the U.S. government. So let me click through here. So just to give you an overview of our agenda today, um, we've had our welcome and overview of ASAP2, um, and then we have four modules that we're going to be going through today. The times are approximate. Um, and at the end of each module, we will have time for Q&A. So please, while we're going through, insert any questions you have about any of the content or any related um, questions that you have from your experience doing um, business development. And then tomorrow we'll have two additional modules to go through, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and wrap up. So for this first module, um, and this is just a reminder from what Catherine already shared, using the chat box, um, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself with your name and your organization and where you're joining us from. And then please also feel free to use the chat to share any, or any of your ideas or experiences or talk with other participants. Um, but if you do have questions, please use the Q&A box that's in the middle of your screen there. As I said, we will pause after each module to go through those questions and answer them. Um, because if they're not in the Q&A box, they might get lost if they're in the chat with all the other information. So please use the Q&A. So today, um, for this first kind of overall learning objectives that we really want to emphasize today, is by the end of this training, hopefully you'll have an increased awareness about U.S. government announcements and how they solicit proposals or applications for funding opportunities. And this is with a particular focus on USAID and PEPFAR. And we also hope this will help improve your understanding of the proposal development process from We'll be covering from pre-solicitation before you know any RFAs or RFPs come out, and we'll we'll speak about up into after um, submission. So what to do after submission, um, and again focusing mostly on solicitations from the U.S. government, particularly USAID. And then we hope that you'll strengthen your knowledge for key considerations, components, and criteria for putting together successful proposals to USAID for this international development programming that we're all very interested in. Um, so just to give you an outline, this is the training, training curriculum. So we've gone through the introduction and I just wanna put a plug in here for the business development training manual. So this training is based on the BD training manual that ASAP2 has created. It is located on the ASAP2 website. So you can find, um, the manual and the slides, a variation of these slides there for your own consumption and your own use um, as needed. And then we'll get into, um, we're in module one, so we're doing our opening introduction. So just kind of laying out, you know, the intention of this training. Of course, it would be great for us to all get together in a room for a full week and do this in person so we can have really rich discussions. But, you know, with the constraints that we have, um, this is the next best thing. So um, you'll see a lot of different training and delivery methods in the in the manual um, that might be of interest for you all to use internally at your organization. Then we'll get into module two, which is an overview of business development, just to kind of um, set the context of what we're talking about when we talk about business development and how that relates to pursuing USG funding and the different mechanisms and processes that the U.S. government uses to procure um, services. And then the third module is we're going to talk about pre-solicitation preparation. So identifying opportunities, deciding whether to pursue them, how to do some pre-work before that final uh, request for applications comes out. 
And we'll talk a little bit about how to form a winning consortium. Module four, we'll get into the live proposal kickoff stage. So this is the most important, probably the most exciting, you know, kind of going step by step on how to create a winning proposal, getting organized and how to understand the requirements from the donor in the solicitation. Um, we'll get into details like a proposal kickoff meeting and other preliminary steps before actually getting into the writing, you know, what kind of um, gaps do we need to fill? And then, like I said, tomorrow, module five, we'll be really, we'll getting into a lot of details on project design and technical and budget proposal development. Um, so we'll really be talking about how to get to designing your approach, designing your interventions, um, how to, you know, go about creating all the different pieces that are required in USAID proposals and including the budget. And then finally, we'll wrap up with post uh, submission um, activities that you can undertake. You know, we submit the proposal, but there's still a little bit to do. So we'll get into some best practices on what to do after submission. And then we'll go ahead and, um, like I said, have plenty of time for Q&A and wrap up at the end of tomorrow's session. So we'll go ahead and dive into, you know, the overview of business development. So we have a poll that I wanted to go ahead and start out with. So I'll ask my colleague to launch the poll for us. This should pop up on your screen momentarily. So um, you'll see there are, I think we have Four questions in this first poll. Um, so please just go one by one. And the first question is, have you been or are currently prime recipients of USG funding? Just kind of getting a sense of, of where you all are at with getting being prime recipients. Question two is, have you or are, are you currently sub-recipients of USG-funded awards? Um, for instance, if you're working with an INGO as a prime recipient. The third question here is, have you applied directly for USG funding via a competitive procurement process? So that means applying um, via an RFA or a notice for funding opportunity. And then the fourth question, just curious if you're familiar with USAID's uh, local capacity strengthening policy and other previous PEPFAR localization targets and the USG locally led development agenda. So we'll give you a few, another few seconds to lock in your answers here. All right, I think we're kind of stabilizing here. Um, so hopefully you can see the results coming up on your screen. Okay, so it looks like 77% of the participants today have been or are currently prime recipients of US government funding. That's fantastic, congratulations. Um, for those that haven't received it yet, we hope what you learned today might contribute to, to getting you those prime funding. Uh, for question two, if you're currently a sub-recipient, we have 79% of you saying that yes, you are, um, and 21% 20, are not yet. Again, hopefully we can get you on a team and get that, get you in a partnership. The third question, have you applied directly for competitive funding? So again, 71% of you, that's great you're familiar with the competitive process, so that's great. And then finally, it looks like 57% are somewhat familiar with these various USG policies around localization and locally led development. Some of you are very familiar, and then others are not, not very familiar. So I would suggest, you know, if you're not familiar um, to find these policies, 
um, to understand what U.S. you know USAID's um, intentions are with local capacity strengthening and what um, U.S. government really means by locally led development, because I think that'll help you all pursue funding in these veins. Great. Thank you, Fig Gray. We can move on here to getting into the content. So for the overview of this particular module, again, we're going to um, help you hopefully acquire basic knowledge of key terms and concepts around business development and proposal development. And then we're going to also talk about the different types of funding that you, PEPFAR and USAID and other USG agencies tend to release that are eligible for local implementing partners like yourselves. And then we hope um, to make you aware of the main phases of the solicitation and proposal development process. And like I said, in the later modules, we'll be getting into a lot more detail on these particular pieces. So for this module, we're going to cover, you know, what is business development, proposal development in the context of USG funding for local implementing partners. And we're also going to talk about um, mechanisms and processes for issuing USG funds. So here on this slide, um, we just want to talk a little bit about USG funding opportunities for local implementing partners. So the U.S. government um, released relatively recently a local capacity strengthening policy and a locally led development agenda to increase the proportion of funding going directly to local organizations. Um, therefore, there's a greater opportunity for local organizations like yourselves to become prime recipients of USAID and other USG funding um, than in the past. There's a real emphasis in the U.S. government of um, really getting funds to local organizations like yourselves. And so with this, strengthening your business development skills and systems will better position you and your organizations to pursue this funding. So what is business development? This is a term that, you know, is used a lot, and especially I would say even in the private sector, but it's really the process of implementing partnership strategies and pursuing funding opportunities across your organization to promote growth and boost revenue. So this is a strategy, this is, you know, the processes that you put in place um, to pursue funding. And this could be, you know, formally with the U.S. government, it could be with other private sector, um, it could be from other NGOs, but it's really the process of, of um, promoting growth and boosting your revenue for your organization. So it's really important, a really important part of this is identi identifying new prospects for maintaining and growing an organization's presence and portfolio. It also includes establishing both long-term strategic partnerships and then project and proposal specific partnerships. So when we're talking about long-term strategic partnerships, that might be in a relationship with USAID or PEPFAR. Um, you know, attending those, you know, meetings and webinars like you are today and, and becoming really familiar with that donor and what their priorities are. And then on the project and proposal specific basis, making you know connections with INGOs that might be pursuing a, um, pursuing funding that needs to partner with local partners or partnering with other local partners in order to implement a project. And again, converting contacts and leads into donors and partners. So you know it does it doesn't just business development doesn't just start with okay, USAID put out an RFA, a request for applications um, for a specific project that they want to fund. It's really building and creating contacts and relationships long before the RFA is ever released, long before that donor is ready to disperse funds. You wanna be creating and, and getting those um, leads in place. And then also, you know, pursuing projects and programs that enable your organization to, live, to deliver on its mission and its values. So it's not just, oh, you know, we see something that 
is giving funding, so let's pursue it. It's how does this project or program enable your organization to further its own mission? How does this project fit in with your goals and your long-term strategic planning, you know, for serving different communities um, that you work with? And BD is also the first critical step in um, PEPFAR USAID program de development and implementation. So this is where especially PEPFAR USAID and other U.S. agencies start their program development is with, you know, the funding cycle and getting these programs um, awarded and working with those implementers to uh, in implement the activities. And so we have business development and then we have proposal development. So again, business development is the umbrella on, under which proposal development sits. So proposal development, like I said, is a key component of business development. And it's about identifying potential specific opportunities and tracking them. So not just kind of, you know, cultivating contacts and hoping someone will want to give you funding, but it's really identifying those potential opportunities and tracking them specifically, you know, and preparing for them before they come out, hopefully. Um, and like I said, conducting pre-positioning and capture efforts uh, to prepare for a notification of funding. So I'll use the word NOFO, RFA, RFP, we'll get into that more. Um, but for the notification of funding opportunity released by the donor. So this is usually what PEPFAR and USAID uses to um, request applications for funding. Proposal development is also about designing the project, you know, designing um, what the interventions, what the activities will be. Um, it's about developing the proposal itself, you know, not only your technical approach, but, you know, all the uh, additional documentation that goes along with it, you know, what your mail plan might be or what your past performance has been and getting everything in that package and ready to submit. And then finally, sending it off to the donor, hopefully he's hearing sooner than later if you're successful. And proposal development, and I think this is something that kind of falls by the wayside as we think we're finished, you know, once we submit that application or that proposal. But really, you know, debriefing internally on the proposal process is important for your organization. If you want to continue to develop your systems and your capacity for business development in general, you know, understanding how, you know, you undertook the proposal process. How did that go? Was it successful? Um, how did everyone work together? Were there challenges and how to um, address those before the next time? And it also includes feedback from the donor. So whether it's a win or a loss, um, understanding how the donor perceived your proposal. Now, of course, if you were successful and were awarded, the donor must have thought very well and highly of your proposal. So you might not get as much feedback, you know, on the specifics. They might say, hey, you won. Um, that's kind of all you need to know. But if you've lost the application, um, you have the opportunity to ask the donor for feedback, either written or verbal feedback, where you can actually, you know, they can go often section by section and give you feedback and say, what were your strengths and your weaknesses for each of those pieces of the application? So again, incorporating this feedback and understanding what the donor was wanting, what the donor was looking for um, is very, very important. And then BD is also, like I've already said, is broader than proposal development. But this training is really focusing on the latter. So we're really focusing on proposal development um, with an emphasis on USAID PEPFAR funding opportunities. So I think um, there are other uh, resources available if you want to talk about kind of resource mobilization and strategic planning those things really play into um, business development. And so here we're gonna go through some of the um, processes for how um, USC, USG, um, you know, issue, issues, requests for funding. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that the US government 
um, goes about procuring procuring um, services and awarding uh, funding. So there are non-competitive ways that the U.S. government does this. So it could be a transition award. So for example, a bridge between a sub award and a prime award. Um, and if an existing prime partner will support a sub award and include capacity strengthening with a gradual transfer of resources and responsibilities. So I have found over my career um, the last 14 years that we're seeing a lot more of this, that the US government is really wanting um, especially INGOs to build into their proposal um, how they intend to transition the funds, the activities, the responsibility of the project to local partners by the end of that five-year project. So we're really seeing this, and this is one way that, um, and maybe some of you have experienced this, local partners are able to kind of take over and gradually take over responsibility and hopefully working with that INGO partner to increase your capacity and you know transition those resources and responsibilities of that project over to the local partner. And then we have a competitive process. Um, and of course, you know, there's various, st various stages and types of competitive processes based on the selection of the award mechanism. So USAID and all other US government agencies have the opportunity to choose different types of mechanisms for how to procure or to award funds. So usually there's multi stages with the formal kind of processes that they use. So we'll get into these each in more detail, but often USAID can start with a request for information. So this is a, a way for them to kind of do market research and to understand you know, what partners, what capacity is out there in a particular country or a particular region to implement um, a specific um, activity, whether it's, you know, maybe something around key populations or it's around orphans and vulnerable children. USAID might issue an, a request for information to understand what types of organizations and what type of capacity those organizations have to respond to a request for uh, applications based around one of those particular subjects. Another um, kind of way they do market research is um, issuing expressions of interest. So it's kind of similar to a request for information, but an expression of interest is really asking you know, asking organizations like yourselves in a particular country, you know, we're thinking about issuing a notice for funding opportunity. Um, how do, you know, what organizations are out there that would be interested in applying for this? Is there an appetite for this type of scope of work for local organizations? So, you know, and they might be combined with a request for information. So it might be that, you know, USAID issues a draft scope of work and ask organizations like yourselves to, you know, think about, you know, is this feasible? What else would you recommend? How else um, would, how, what else would you suggest in order to make the scope of work um, actionable? And then with that, they might also ask for you to, you know, submit a capacity statement or um, past performance information to understand, okay, if we did issue this scope of work in this particular country, how many organizations might be able to respond or how many organizations are interested in responding to this? And this gives them an idea because if if USAID, you know, writes out a scope of work um, that, you know, implementers like yourselves who are on the ground, who know this context and the situation, and you say, mm, you know, if they get feedback that maybe this scope of work isn't really feasible in the way it's written, maybe some tweaks need to be made about the population that it's working with or the type of um, interventions that are going with it. Maybe, you know, they want to work with key populations, but USAID has completely forgotten about, you know, the social behavior change aspects. So how can, 
you know, how, it's an opportunity for local organizations like yourselves to kind of impact how USAID is going to issue that later um, revised scope of work. So this is a very important time in USAID's uh, procurement phase to impact how that final request for applications comes out. So if you do see requests for in information or expressions of interest, I highly encourage you to um, participate in those because it is a is it is it is a chance for organizations like yourselves to have a voice in how that eventual final scope of work and final you know proposal will look. And then once USAID has you know taken this request for information and understood you know what types of organizations might be interested, then we get into them issuing notice of funding opportunities. Um, asking for requests for applications or requests for proposals. So we'll continue to um, get into those, which I probably went a little further uh, than I should have already. But again, RFIs are typically used um, in the early stages of the procurement process. So again, they allow the donor to gauge the pool of uh, candidates, applicants. Um, they give the donor the ideas and information um, and the design for the final RFA or RFP. And it could also result in initial shortlisting of applicants that might be invited to respond. Um, this happens occasionally that they will want you to respond to an RFI and then perhaps only invite those that responded. Um, I don't see that very often, um, but it can happen. And again, responding to an RFI doesn't constitute a bid or a proposal. I mean, you might see an RFI and not see a final request for application until, you know, one or two years later. So it's a very kind of preliminary step in USAID's uh, market research. So it could happen very early in the process, or you could see an RFI and the subsequent RFA be issued, you know, in the, in the next six months. So it really kind of defend, depends. But, you know, RFIs are nice because it allows vendors like the U.S. government to provide information and then get information from potential applicants on your capabilities and, again, can inform USAID's decision-making process. And so, again, an expression of interest is an opportunity to showcase your qualifications, um, you know, general information about your organization, who your contact person is, what type of organization you are. And then it gives you a chance to um, provide brief information that describes your organization's capabilities and your interest in implementing the U.S. state activity to achieve the particular objectives of that, you know, project that they're kind of advertising for. And again, you might be asked to submit some past performance information. So this is your chance to describe your experience working in a subject area with relevant stakeholders, um, how, you know, the duration of past activities, the scale of those projects and budgets. So, you know, if USAID is asking, has an EOI on something that's $20 million and you have implemented similarly or not, um, that will give them an idea if that's feasible for the type of um, audience that they're, they're putting this out for. And then also, you know, information on the populations reached in the activities. So again, not just about the implementer or, you know, who might bid on this product, but also, you know, is this going to be applicable to the population that the proposal is aimed to support? And so getting more into the competitive funding, so we have notice for funding opportunity and request for application. So again, NOFO and RFA. Um, oftentimes, you'll hear me use these interchangeably. Um, USA will use them in the same document. It'll say notice for funding and then RFA number, blah, blah, blah. So just to keep in mind that these are the same thing, it's just a different way of saying it. Um, and this is a call for applications that will result in a grant or a cooperative agreement for an assistance award. So we have assistance in the graphic on the right, on the right side, 
um, and then acquisition, which is which comes from a request for proposals. So a call for proposals will result in a contract. And in other words, that's an acquisition award. Um, so acquisition can include a cost reimbursement contract, fixed price contract, time and materials contracts. Um, so these are the mechanisms that USAID uses um, with contractors if they want to procure, you know, someone to build housing or if they want to procure, you know, other construction or they want to procure oftentimes um, monitoring and evaluation services or oftentimes acquisition because um, the U.S. government really just wants to pay for someone to, you know, we have a specific scope of work and we know exactly what you, we want someone to do. So it's going to be a contract. Whereas yeah. assistance awards like grants and cooperative agreements are more flexible. You know, they're looking for um, applicants like yourselves to design uh, the technical approach. So they're looking for you to design what activities make sense to reach the goals of the project. So, you know, oftentimes, I imagine you all will be really dealing with assistance awards um, and cooperative agreements. So requests for application, again, is used primarily by grant making agencies to invite organizations or individuals to apply for funding for specific projects or initiatives. Um, the RFA will provide all the information that you need to submit your application and it'll also include, you know, the objectives of the opportunity, what the eligibility criteria is. Um, as we've seen, you know, USAID is programming funds directly towards local implementing partners. So sometimes they'll say the eligibility is for local partners only or um, require perhaps, you know, it's full and open so that INGOs can apply, but they might require um, having local partners on the team or might require a transition plan to a local implementer by the end of the project. The RFA will also, again, tell you what the application requirements are. You know, is it a 25 page application or, um, you know, what type of uh, supporting documentation is needed? It'll tell you the funding amount. So it'll tell you, you know, that ceiling dollar value that uh, you'll have to budget your activity towards. And it'll also provide you evaluation criteria. So you will know exactly, you know, how much, um, any piece of the application is worth, what the criteria is that they're basing the final decision on. And so applicants respond to an RFA by submitting a formal application, and this will describe your, you know, proposed, you know, the, the proposed project or program, you know, the technical approach that you yourselves have designed and how it aligns with the objectives of the funding opportunity. It'll include budget details and other, you know, relevant supporting documentation. And then the agency, USAID, PEPFAR, will review the applications based on the criteria specified in the RFA and awards funding to the applicant. Um, they will make awards to the applicants who best meet the agency's goals and priorities. So again, in this case, it's not really about, you know, um, making sure your budget is, you know, as small and as lean as possible. Whereas for requests for proposals and contracts, you know, USAID will, will, will really be looking at, you know, your budget and the value for money. So again, for proposals, it's a formal solicitation from a U.S. government agency for proposals from potential vendors or contractors for a specific project or requirement. So again, whereas for an RFA, you're an applicant, applicant, you're a, you know, a, a partner, um, a contract, you know, they're looking for vendors or contractors. And RFPs, again, will detail the specifications, you know, required for the proposal. They'll give you requirements for what needs to be submitted. Um, they will also provide evaluation criteria and instructions for submitting the proposal. 
Um, and very similar to an RFA, vendors or contractors will respond to the RFP by submitting a formal proposal that outlines how they will meet the agency's requirements. Um, and this can still include technical approaches, but really emphasizing, I think, more pricing schedules, how you're going to deliver, you know, it's just like if you want to build a house, you know, you really want to know from your contractor, your builder, you know, what's the timeline, what's the price, what are the, you know, the cost of materials, when are you going to have this finished, and that's really what, what U.S. government is looking for in this type of um, request. And then the agency, again, will evaluate the proposals based on the criteria in the RFP and select the proposal that meets the best value or meets its needs best. And so um, we're going to kind of wrap up this section. I hope that made sense. Um, the solicitation or proposal development process occur, um, occur, occur Occurs, <laughs> occurs as follows. Um, we're going to get into in the next module pre-solicitation preparation. And then again, getting into live proposal kickoff, developing the proposal. And then like I said, tomorrow we're getting into project design for the technical and budget proposal development, and then talking about post-submission activities. Um, so like we've like I've shown before, each module consists of multiple ske steps and explained in detail in those slides. So I'm really going to try my best to emphasize and repeat information so that it's clear. So I think we'll pause for a couple of minutes to see if there's any questions. So I'll ask my colleague Mesmi to support me and let me know if we have any questions and we'll do our best to respond to those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, um, for um, this uh, uh, clarification. We have a couple of questions that um, some participants raised. First, that they want to make sure that the presentation will be shared with them. Um, that's one point. The second is that how to, um, I mean, how to identify potential opportunity uh, and tracking them. Is there any uh, part of your presentation, you are going to address that component. And uh, for those organizations that have never uh, applied for any funding opportunity with uh, USAID, um, what does it take for those who are interested to apply? What mm -hmm. are the steps that they need to uh, uh, engage actually? So I'll pause here and then I'll have one last question if there are more Please do not hesitate to, to type in on question QA. Uh, uh, I will reach out to Rebecca after. Rebecca, over to you. Okay. Great. Um, yes, yeah, so we will um I think share the slides. My my ASAP colleagues can um confirm. But these slides again with the training manual are available on ASAP 2's website. Um so I think we will highlight um where you can find those, but along with the other manuals and policies that Catherine went over at the beginning of the uh, presentation, you can find this and the slides um, on the ASAP2 website, but we'll also, I think, be sharing them after the presentation. And then, yes, so the next module, we will go over how to identify potential app opportunities and how to track them. Um, and we'll talk about some formal and informal ways that you can find out about up upcoming opportunities from USAID, um, things that I've come across in the last, like I said, I've been doing business development for 14 years. So I've heard a lot and seen a lot of different ways for organizations to become aware. Um, and then if you haven't um, applied for US government funding before, um, and we can get into this, and some of the other modules, I think we'll we'll talk on partnerships. You know, you can really, um, I think, get a foot in the door, as we say, by partnering with an INGO or um, another organization that has gotten U.S. government funding before. And if you're acting as a sub partner or sub recipient, that's a way for you to kind of get, like I said, get your foot in the door. Um, understand kind of the requirements, the, you know, there's a lot of rules and regulations about receiving um, U.S. government funding. 
And I think, you know, with the locally led development, local capacity building, a lot of INGOs um, are really putting in place their own policies and their own um, activities to really work closely with local partners and um, to form partnerships that way. So I would really suggest, you know, getting together with your other local local um, colleagues on, you know, if you if you know another organization that has been successful getting U.S. government funding, you know, maybe um, they would be willing to uh, support or, or just give an insight overview of how they how they uh, accomplish that, though I understand, you know, with the competitiveness of U.S. government funding, um, you know, everyone can be partners or competitors. So, uh, there's always that little bit of uh, tension there, but, you know, I, and I think also working with INGOs, so um, getting to understand the INGOs that are working in the same uh, technical area that you are, you know, if you work particularly with, let's say, key populations, or you're working with OVC, doing some research to understand, you know, what other INGOs are working in that space and and approaching them about partnerships or understanding, you know, how that how they um, bring partners onto their projects would be a good way to do that. But we'll get into more about, you know, forming partnerships um, in the next module. So are there other questions I haven't gotten to, Ms. Me? Yes, we do. We do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, one, uh, if you can clarify for some, the difference between the RF RFA and NOFO, is that mm -hmm. a different? And um, someone wants to, to to hear from you if there's a, any possibility for somebody working with um, with uh, another partner uh, uh, funded by USAID as in the construction can apply as individual for a, an, a, any additional grants as individual. And um, somebody wants to uh, hear from you uh, about the minimum requirements uh, for an organization to apply. Is there any uh, basic uh, capacity or, or, or size that is needed for an organization to apply for it? Is there any pre requirement that you can share with participants? Or I will pose here also. Um, let's see. So the difference between a NOFO and an RFA so um, there isn't. It's just another way for you at the U.S. government, especially USAID, um, calls them a notice for funding opportunity and a request for application. So like I said, they will um, use this, those two words in the same document. So I think just remember that, okay, NOFO equals RFA and RFA equals NOFO. So it's just kind of another term. I do notice that the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, um, who also gives out PEPFAR funds, I think they use NOFO maybe more often, but I think they've kind of caught up to each other. So you used to not see NOFO very often coming from USAID specifically. I'm not sure what's behind that, but I think just the key is just to remember that they're the same thing. So if you see NOFO, RFA, it's the same thing. If you see RFP, request for proposal, then that means it's a contract. And you probably, I imagine, would not be interested in those types of um, funding. And let's see. Sorry, Mesmi, I lost the thread on the other question. Yeah, Maybe the, just one at a time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think so. So the question was that if, uh, for example, in the consortium, uh, partner are working together, I have been receiving fund for, with you, from, from USAID, is, is there any, are they eligible to apply for different grants uh, or proposal uh, as individual? That's one. Yeah. And yeah, I will post yeah. it. Yeah, if I understand, you know, you let's say you're you're part of a consortium, um, and you're implementing the project. I mean, you know, your organization can you know compete for other things. Um, I would say if you're talking about, you know, you're on a consortium for one proposal, and then another organization approaches you wanting to go for the same thing, 
Um, you'd have to talk with the prime, you know, your prime partner to say that you want to be non-exclusive. And again, we can get into this in the next module, I think, you know, exclusivity versus non-exclusivity. But I think, um, and even USAID is kind of restricting um, organizations from requiring partners to be exclusive so that, you know, you have as many opportunities as you can to participate in other proposals. So definitely keep non-exclusivity in mind if you want to, to bid on multiple things with other partners. Yeah, uh, and some someone is interesting to, to hear from your experience if there's any minimum requirements in terms of size okay. of, of capacity for an organization to be, to feel comfortable to apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is where other ASAP, um, you know, all of the policies and um, templates and other webinars that ASAP um, has done over the last several years would be really helpful because if you're a new organization, um, to U.S. government funding, there are a lot of um, rules and regulations that the U.S. government has on who they will issue funds to. So you really have to prove that you have um, the capacity, you have um, systems, you know, financial tracking systems, different policies in place. And I think ASAP and ASAP2 have um, kind of inventoried a lot of those things. So I would go back to the ASAP website and look at kind of those different things because I think they are laid out but there are a lot of minimum requirements and um, like I mentioned before you know if you're new to this um, pulling on those resources you know to get an organization ready to be a prime recipient would be very helpful and, and really actually um, obligated <laughs> you'd be obligated to go through and, and put these things in place um, and I think otherwise working with a prime recipient or other partners who have received U.S. government funding before, they can really support your organization to uh, put systems in place and, you know, register, you know, you have to be registered in SAM.gov and have, um, you know, different uh, federal, you know, federal numbers that are required kind of in U.S. law to like give funding. So I think using the ASAP ASAP as a resource and other partners um, is probably the best first steps on that. Um, two more questions for you, um, Rebecca. One is uh, related to um, the solicitation process. Is there any time where the USAID can change from fixed awards, cooperative agreement or grant or what, at what stage mm -hmm. um, this is, is decided whether it will be or cooperative agreement or fix a word or, 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 or fix our amount mm -hmm. our word or okay. it, it's a cooperative agreement. Right. So yeah. So this is where, you know, kind of um it depends on USA and the particular mission that you're working with. Um but you know if they want to work with local partners and they want to, you know, either have those transition awards or directly funding local implementing partners, um, they'll decide early on and that will be in the RFA, you know, what type of award it is, um, you know, and again, it'll either be a grant or a cooperative agreement, which these days it's, it's nearly 99.9% .9 of the time cooperative agreements. And if you're acting as a sub-recipient, then, um, I think it's important to talk with your prime um, of what type of award would make sense um, to have to work with your organization. So I, I think oftentimes a fixed amount award is um, what USAID or other prime recipients use to work with local partners. Um, and I think it just, you know, I'm, I'm not really... Um, familiar with those type of, you know, sub, sub award mechanisms. That's not my uh, forte, but, um, you know, I think USAID understands, you know, that many local partners are new to this type of funding and there are a lot of rules and regulations. And so they're trying to make it, I think, as easy as it can be. <laughs> so following all their rules and policies. Um, so I think, you know, working with, uh, and also, you know, as part of you know business development and having those relationships with 
you know, your contacts at you um, at the mission, at USAID, um, at the embassy, and advocating, you know, outside of any type of proposal process, um, what types of awards or what kind of support, you know, local implementing partners need to participate what is also very important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one uh, but it's very interesting to to see if local NGO are eligible for non competitive funding, and um, what could be the process for that? Well, for non competitive funding, so like um, I talked about would be mostly transition funding. Although I think I have heard under ASAP that USAID has approached organizations. Um, USAID has approached organizations directly to to um, put in applications. So it just kind of depends on your you know relationship with USAID, how how you know, or if USAID knows you and knows your organization in the particular area that you work in. Um, but I think, um, you know, like I said, INGOs are really conscious of. Um, USAID and PEFAR's desire to get funds to local directly to local organizations and, and requiring these transition um, plans within proposals. So I think having relationships with INGOs um, so that they know what your capabilities are, what type of work you do, where you work, you know, geographically, et cetera, is important. And also it's important to um, you know, keep your eye out for these. Uh, NOFOs and RFAs that are issued and to see which ones are requiring the transition plans because, um, you know, if they're required in the RFA, then they're required in the proposal and, and the evaluation criteria is going to um, determine, you know, which organization um, is successful. So I think keeping your eye out on opportunities that have these requirements is a way to position yourself so, hey, we see that, you know, in this RFA, a transition to a local partner is required. We're a local partner. We would love to work with you. You know, positioning in that way can be really helpful as well. Yeah, in that angle, somebody wants to know what's the best time to conduct routine search for mm -hmm. um, no fool. What's the best time? Great. So this is actually a perfect segue, Mesmi, um, to the next module. So we're going to get in in the next module of how to search for new opportunities or how to become aware of new opportunities. Um, so I think we should go ahead and dive into the next module. And then if you have more questions, we'll pause the end of that module to discuss more. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Over to you. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Great questions. All right. So we're in module three. So this is the pre um, pre solicitation preparation. Um, so again, just to kind of set the stage, we really want hope this section will um, make you aware of various sources of funding and be able to access existing U.S. government resources to identify opportunities for funding. Understanding key considerations for the go no go decision making. And then appreciate the need for early preparation for solicitations and how pre-positioning capture work can increase your chances for success. And we also hope we can talk about better positioning yourselves to form a winning consortium. So again, we'll cover how to identify funding opportunities and how to decide whether or not to pursue an opportunity. What um goes into pre-positioning and capture work, and then forming a winning consortium. So a lot of the topics that have been um, put up for questions, and I think very, very important. So opportunity identification. So this goes back to the question we just had. There are multiple ways to identify potential funding opportunities from USAID and other US government agencies and donors. So we have formal and informal ways. So we'll go through a form, a few formal ways that we do this. So of course, checking um, USAID's official websites. So work with USAID.gov and SAM.gov for funding opportunities. Now SAM.gov is where you will find requests for proposals. So that's where they post 
where they're looking um, for acqu um, acquisition. So um, this is where they'll put, you know, they'll put solicitations for projects, but also you'll see they're looking for, you know, someone to build housing for US USAID employees or something. <laughs> so um, you can look at those. And then grants.gov. So that will be the primary place you all will want to look for potential funding opportunities. Um, grants.gov um, is where USAID and other, all US agencies um, post grant and cooperative agreement opportunities. So this is where you would look for USAID. And this is where you would look for CDC, um, since those are the two PEPFAR um, funders. Um, but you'll find every other agency, you know, you'll see, um, you know, Department of Defense and Department of State. Um, Department of State also, also issues grant and cooperative agreement opportunities, um, just, you know, kind of different um, focus for them, but it's similar. Being aware and following the USAID business forecast. So if you go to usaid.gov and slash business dash forecast, that's where USAID will um, publish, you know, right now what they see to be, what they are planning to fund in the next, you know, immediate time frame to, I would say they put up to a year. So up to a year in advance, you might see an opportunity posted on the forecast. And we'll, we'll talk about this more um, in a subsequent slide. If you also visit and monitor other websites or other you know, social media platforms for donors, I mean, other donors outside the US government, um, foundations, corporations, INGOs, um, and other sources of funding and partnership. So oftentimes, you know, again, an INGO who was required to have a grants pool in their project um, will oftentimes, you know, post their own requests for applications um, to fund, you know, local organizations through grants on our current project. So understanding, again, and knowing which INGOs are working in your, in your country and your specific um, technical expertise area you know, if if you know, if you're focusing on key populations, who are those INGOs that also work with key populations and monitoring, um, monitoring their websites will help a lot. You know, I think uh, LinkedIn and, you know, other places like that uh, are also places where they advertise. So I think kind of having websites and media platforms kind of top of mind to just kind of take a look and, and having someone on your staff that will kind of monitor these sites on a regular basis is really helpful. Um, and then this last bullet here is becoming familiar with USAID's country development cooperation strategy for your country. So that's again, accessible on the USAID website. This, the um, country development strategy uh, the CDCS is um, USAID's plan for, you know, it's a five-year plan for, and they have one for each country. I, I understand that USAID was trying to get them all updated. I don't know if they've updated them all, but um, each country should have a strategy from USAID. And this details, you know, what are USAID's priorities for your country over the next five years? So, is USAID really focusing on different health issues? Are they focusing on education? Are they focusing on, um, you know, energy and climate change? This is really where you get the best insight as to what USAID is planning to fund and planning to focus on over a five-year period in your country. So to become familiar with this and use this as a way to engage with USAID, um, Again, if I keep using the same example, but if you're an organization that works with, you know, key populations or OVC or uh, mothers, um, you know, maternal newborn child health, you know, you can understand from the CDCS if USAID has a focus on that, if they have goals and objecti objectives around, you know, improving those um indicators around those uh, things in your country, 
then you can take that and, and ask for a meeting with USA to present about your organization and say, hey, you know, we work with key populations. We understand that that's a priority for USAID. So, you know, here's a background of what our organization does and we would love to work with you. That's just one example of, of how you could use the CDSCS to kind of before even a particular notice for funding comes out that you can, you know, create that link to USA so they know your organization and they know who you are. And informal ways um, are sometimes the more fun or more interesting ways to find out about funding. Um, word of mouth from your networks, you know, um, it's really interesting the things that you hear when you're at a meeting or at a closeout meeting or um, at a meeting to, you know, hear about um, results from another USAID funded project is that you might overhear something. You might have a colleague who spoke to someone at USAID a couple of weeks ago who said, yeah, we're, you know, thinking about, you know, having a follow-on project to the, the project that's going to close out a year from now. Um, so it's just really important to keep up your networks and, you know, have those informal meetings with colleagues, you know, over coffee or, uh, again, attending industry events or events that USAID is sponsoring. A meeting with other stakeholders, you know, if you're at the Ministry of Health, maybe they'll mention that they met with USAID, you know. Um, there's there's a lot of different ways, and I think it's just keeping your, your networks and your eyes and ears open um, for any kind of insinuation that, you know, funding might be coming for something in particular. Um, and again, you know, visiting colleagues' Facebook or LinkedIn accounts, you know, um, people love to share their successes. They love to share what they're working on next. Maybe you have a colleague that you used to work with that went to another organization and, you know, they just updated that they now work at USAID. You know, that's another way, you know, to, to kind of follow the, the career paths of your colleagues and see where they're working now or Maybe they're working with an INGO that's implementing the current project, and maybe they, you know, might share a little information. So, again, just keeping your networks open, keeping um, your eyes and ears open to, you know, any inkling that, you know, funding is coming or USAID wants to continue or, you know, USAID wants to change direction. These can be really helpful ways to do that. So going back to the USAID business forecast. So this is a leading and primary way a lot of us understand and know what USAID is planning to fund in the next, like I said, immediate, you know, immediate, you know, month to two months to, you know, I think I've seen up to things that are two years out on um, the business forecast. So it's just really when USAID, when a USAID mission decides that they want to fund something, that they're planning a project that might still be in design, might just be a glimmer, you know, in someone's eye that, yes, we want to fund something. Um, this is where they're supposed to put it. Some missions are better than others of keeping these updated. And you, you know, might have experience with this yourself of knowing which USA missions are better than others. Um, but this is the formal way that USAID says, yes, we are planning to fund this particular project in this particular country. And we anticipate releasing the RFA in six months from now whether or not that actually comes out in six months is also a question. <laughs> I've never really seen anything come out the first time it was uh, forecasted to come out. Usually things get delayed and delayed and something that appeared on the forecast might not have yet come out two years later. It just really depends on the internal processes that USAID goes through to you know, get approvals, design the scope of work, um, and getting all the kind of sign up that they need, especially if it's a high, you know, a high dollar value. Um, I think there are thresholds within the U.S. government that, you know, if an agency wants to release a request for funding over a certain amount of, 
of money that they have to get, you know, additional levels of approvals and signatures. So something that's 20 million won't need as many approvals as something that's 100 million. So again, it just really depends on, on the internal processes of USAID. But the key thing when you come to this website, so again, it's usa.gov slash business forecast. I have this bookmark and I check it at least once a day, if not multiple times a day. Um, but as you can see here, there are multiple filters that you can use to search for something. Oftentimes, the only filter I use is here where it says operating unit on the screen with the red circle around it. And this is where you can choose your country because the operating operating unit is the USAID mission. So if your country has a USAID mission, let's say USAID um, Zimbabwe, you can go in here and just look for particular opportunities for Zimbabwe or Mozambique. Um, if your country does not have a mission, perhaps they're just part of a regional mission. So you can look up the West Africa mission or um, the regional um, Asia um, mission or East Africa, you know, it just kind of depends on, on who and which mission is going to issue the request for application. So, um, but oftentimes, nine times out of 10, if you just search for your country, you'll be able to see everything that USAID plans to fund for the next, you know, at least few months or a year. Um, you might not find anything or you might find several things. It just really depends. And I will also add for the USAID for business forecast, each quarter USAID um, issues, um, there's a period of time where USAID will allow implementers like yourselves to submit questions. So if you see something on the forecast and it hasn't been updated for six months, the release date has come and gone, no information, then that would be a perfect time to ask that mission to please update the forecast. So that each quarter, hopefully there's a trigger for each mission to update the forecast and you know give implementers as much information as they can about where the procurement stands. So if you get the, the issue, the questions and answers, so everyone can see them on the website, and you can, you know, look up a particular opportunity that you are thinking of pursuing or see what, you know, the mission has to say. Oftentimes they'll say, you know, it's still under design. It's still being designed. <laughs> so that probably tells you there's still a few months away from actually issuing that RFA. Um, but if they're able to give you like really specific information, then it's probably closer or um, going to follow the actual release date. And so this is just an example. Um, let's say you go on here and you're in South Africa and you click, you know, South Africa. So this one's obviously a couple of years old, um, but you can see that, you know, in the uh, forecast, you know, this is the information that USAID um, provides. So unfortunately here, the, the, the project wasn't named yet, so the name was TBD, but it'll tell you, you know, it's for South Africa. Um, more than 50% of the funding was coming from PEPFAR. It'll give you the name of the person at USAID who is the contact person. It'll tell you eligibility criteria. So this is where, again, you can search to find um, local only um, eligible um opportunities, they will say here, you know, if it's programmed for locals only, or if it'll be free and open, which means, you know, INGOs could also bid on it. So this is a good place to look for those local only opportunities. And then on the right side, um, you can see the action award type. So that would say usually a cooperative agreement, but if there's other, you know, if it's a contract or if it's going to be coming out under another type of mechanism, you'll get that information there. And then you'll see there's an anticipated solicitation release date. So that gives you, you know, what USAID is planning, when they're planning to release it, and then the start date of the project. So, okay, they're planning to release it 
September 30th, 2023, and they anticipated to have it awarded and the project starting on September 30th, 2024. So you can see here, they were already planning for a year between issuing the request for applications and when they're actually going to start the project. So uh, that's something again to you know put into your own internal plan of okay we might have several bids uh, applications to put in this year but we might not hear about them for another six months or a year after that so that really plays a part in your planning and budgeting and then you'll see there's also a total estimated cost so they give you a range of you know the dollar value of this project so for this one it was between 25 and 49.99 million so um kind of a big gap, but, you know, you could probably guess, you know, in your pre-planning process that, okay, you know, especially if this were uh, a follow-on to a project that's already being implemented that was around $40 million, you know, give or take, maybe this project will be around the same. So just gives you an idea of, you know, the value and the type of capacity that'll go into implementing something of that size. And then um, here we have grants.gov. So grants.gov has been um, revamped over the last, I think, year or two. Um, so they did update kind of how you search for opportunities. But if you go to search for grants on grants.gov, it gives you a lot of op options here on the left side. So again, you can filter um, for forecasted and posted opportunities. So uh, USAID and CDC will often post forecasted opportunities. So in addition to the forecast website, they'll put forecasted opportunities here. So you can, you know, so they'll give you a little bit of information of when they plan to uh, post that opportunity. You can also search by funding instrument type, eligibility. So again, this is where, um, I'm not sure if they really have a proper kind of locals only eligibility type, um, but you can see it has unrestricted, i.e. open to any entity or others. And I think oftentimes local entities fall under the others, so might not be as reliable. Um, they of course have the different um, technical categories that you could search by and then by agency. So I think the most important thing here is just searching by agency. So if you want to search by Agency of International Development, USAID, that'll just bring up all the USAID opportunities. So that's what you see on the right center of the screen. Um, at the time, these were all the USAID opportunities that were posted or forecasted at that time. You can also search for, you know, U.S. Department of Agriculture. You know, they do some different um, development, um, you know, food for education programming. If you want to search for CDC, that's under the Department of Human um, Human Health and Services. I probably have that wrong. But the Department of um, Health for USAID, for U.S. the U.S. government. <laughs> um, so the CDC would fall under that agency. Um, and so coming back to some of the eligibility requirements, so um, the U.S. government requires that all organizations have what they call a UEI, a unique um, entity identifier number, um, and you cannot you receive U.S. government funding without this number. So this is kind of, um, it used to be a tax identifying number, and they've changed it to this UEI. So if your organization doesn't already have a 12-digit UEI number, you should go ahead and visit SAM.gov. Since this is the official website of the U.S. government that new um, local implementing partners can use to register. So again, if you're not already registered, you should probably go ahead and start this process so that when a funding opportunity comes up, you're not spending time trying to do this and a proposal at the same time. And if you're working with an INGO and you're going to be a subrecipient to an INGO, they are going to ask for this number or ask, you know, if you are registered in SAM.gov. 
So again, you know, in order for them to be able to issue, you know, and pass through U.S. government funds to a subrecipient, they need to know or you need to be registered in SAM.gov so that they can issue funds. And then, you know, other eligibility um, considerations, the U.S. government, you know, funding opportunities can be open to all kinds of organizations, or they might be restricted to INGOs or local organizations. But each NOFO will specify, or, you know, again, the forecast will specify, although that could change by the time the RFA is issued. Um, so the final NOFO will give you that final eligibility criteria. So, you know, you should be sure to confirm your eligibility and only track or pursue opportunities that you qualify for. If it's something that's free and open that other INGOs can um, pursue, that would be a great time to approach INGOs for partnership um, so that you can pursue those together. And often, even if an opportunity is open to all organizations, extra points will be awarded to local implementing partners. So this is especially true of the CDC. They do in their evaluation criteria for different funding opportunities, they will give extra points if you're a local organization. Um, so this is definitely an advantage over any INGO. Um, I've seen those points be 20 to 30 extra points. So um, you'd already have 20 to 30 extra points over a competitor in that particular case. And so deciding to pursue an opportunity, you know, there's really an importance to prioritization. Um, if it's not feasible or a good use of your organization's resources to pursue every opportunity you qualify for. So, you know, there might be five different opportunities that are for local organizations only, but it's not really going to be feasible for one organization to pursue each and every one. So you really have to review those opportunities and prioritize which one's more feasible. <clears throat> it takes a lot of, you know, precious resources and especially staff time to pursue an opportunity. So the potential return on investment of that investment must be worth the effort. And you really should be just strategic in deciding which opportunities to pursue. So you should really only be focusing on opportunities that align with your mission, vision, and values, um, for which you have a strong chance of winning, and for which you have the capacity, i.e. adequate resources and availability, to deliver a quality proposal. So in this little, uh, image on the right, you know, you really have to think of, you know, when you're looking at any opportunity, what does the donor want? What are they saying, you know, are the goals of the, the project? What are, what's the dollar value? Um, and then what your organization can offer. So can you offer the donor what they're looking for? Can you offer them the services or the activities that they want with the particular population and in the geographic area they're looking for? And then thinking about what the situation requires. So you might be able to provide the donor with what they're looking for, but if all of your staff are on vacation at the same time that the RFA comes out, it's going to be very difficult for you to put in a proposal at that time. So it requires a lot of planning for your own resources and thinking about how are we going to be able to respond. So key considerations of a go or no go decision, um, you know, is it within your experience or expertise? Are there any gaps that you would need to fill with potential partners? Is it strategic for the growth and expansion of your organization and its mission? Is it being awarded through a mechanism that your organization can implement? Is it presenting any risks? And if there are, can those risks be mitigated, whether it's financial or, um, you know, risks from, you know, implementing in a geographic area that is hard to get to or working with a group, uh, you know, 
a population that's hard to reach or um, you need extra resources to, you know, interact with them? And then is it feel feasible and realistic to secure? So does your organization have adequate time and resources to pull together a high quality proposal? Is there a good chance of winning? So you can have all of the rest, but, you know, as I said, if all your staff are on vacation and you don't have anyone to actually write the proposal, then, you know, everything else kind of goes out the window if you're not actually able to put pen to paper and resources into putting the proposal together. So if you can answer yes, you know, to all of these different questions, um, you know, you'll go into the next phase. You'll start preparing for um, preparing for the opportunity, getting resources together, figuring out your partnerships. But if the answer is no, then something you can consider is approaching another organization to apply with them as a subpartner. Or if the answer is no, you have to just kind of accept that you're letting this opportunity go. And instead, you'll use this time and resources to pursue something else. So the importance of pre-positioning and capture work has really come into focus, I think, for a lot of organizations over the last five plus years. Um, early preparation for bids is key and it's a critical factor for a successful proposal. Um, you know, usually USA only gives 30 to 45 days, so that's four to six weeks to respond to an RFA um, from the date it's released. So if you're starting from scratch the day you find it on grants.gov, you're going to be at a disadvantage and you're going to have a lot of work to do in those 30 to 45 days versus another organization that's been preparing for it for six months already. So you just really have to be conscientious of, you know, what the competition is doing, what are other organizations, are they recruiting, are they gathering information, have they already signed up partners before the RFA has even come out. And again, referring to the business forecast and any intelligence you can gather through your networks to undertake preparatory work um, is really important and is really um going to put you in a better place to respond when it actually goes live. And like I said, pre-planning work can start weeks, months, or even years in advance. So at some INGOs that I previously worked at, I worked on preparing for bids up to two years in advance of the actual RFA going live. So there's a lot of, you know, time and resources that, you know, large NGOs are putting into these bids. Um, because they have the resources, you know, they have the funding, they have the staff. Um, <clears throat> but even, you know, if something is for local partners only, you're going to be competing against your fellow colleagues. So any pre-planning that you can do is going to um, save you headache later in the process. So to talk about um, what, it, you know, what is pre-positioning and capture, um, it really is a process that starts when the go decision is made and continues until the opportunity is released. So it's that time between, you know, we found on the, you know, USAID forecast that they're planning to uh, fund a particular project in a particular country. You know, we want to go for it. We have the capabilities, technical capabilities, we have the staffing and the um, resources to put the proposal together. So we're making a go decision at this point with the information that we have, and we're gonna work on what we can until it goes live. And so part of the pre-positioning process is making a thorough assessment of the opportunity and the local needs and priorities. So, you know, what is USAID asking for under this opportunity? And then what are the needs, you know, to make it happen? What are the priorities, you know, in that particular country or with that particular Ministry of Health to, you know, make this project come together? It also includes analysis of the competition and potential partners. So like I said, if this is a competitive process, there's going to be other organizations that are also going to put in proposals. So you really need to know 
what are these competitors doing? Are they already working in the area? Have they been implementing a similar project? Um, do they have partners that they were working with who are no longer going to uh, be on this next bid? So kind of understanding who are the players who can implement this project and how can you compete against them or how might you work with one of them? And then you also need to assess your own organization's technical and other capabilities. So can you really cover all of the technical areas that this is this project is going to require? Do you have any weaknesses? Have you had any issues in previous projects that you've um, implemented that USAID might wonder, well, are they capable? Um, you know, just kind of really taking a, a look inward and to understand what your strengths are, but also any weaknesses and how to um, overcome any of those weaknesses. So all of these things give you information and then you can begin to develop your strategy to resources, resource the proposal effort and, and identify your proposal team. Um, this is a, you know, a way for you to understand how you're going to actually have the manpower to put a proposal together. And yes, if two of your staff are on leave at that time, what are you going to do to fill those gaps? Are you going to hire consultants? Are you going to pull someone off a project to come work on the proposal? Just, you know, really planning ahead of how you're going to do that. You'll also want to develop your partnering strategy and to begin to form your consortium. You'll also want to develop your initial technical management and budget strategies and in recruitment of key personnel. And then you might also start writing certain sections, you know, anything that you can kind of go ahead and write ahead of time would be very helpful. So that can include country context and background. It can include um, your corporate capabilities, past performance, getting um, you know your basic budget costs together, anything that you can do ahead of time that will be less stressful once the RFA goes live. So for an example, um, if you know a USAID-funded ING-led cooperative agreement is scheduled to end a year from now, and you've heard that there will be a follow-on award that's only eligible for local organizations as prime recipients, you can start to position yourself to apply for that follow-on now. So again, that can include seeking information on the key problems or priorities of the target population and the zone that it's working in. You can find out the strengths and weaknesses of the incumbent, as well as what approaches were successful and should be maintain maintained or scaled up in the follow-on. You can get intelligence on potential competitors and thinking about your competitive advantages and your unique selling points. You can also establish and strengthen partnerships, including exploring options for consortium members, implementing partners, subrecipients, you know, any organization that you might need to bring on to fill any gaps to make sure you're successful in this project. And then you can also start to headhunt or recruit for key personnel. So if you need, um, you know, oftentimes USAID requires up to five key personnel to be named with um, CVs in your application. And so it's really helpful to start early on to identify those key staff, especially, you know, your chief of party, your director of finance, um, MEL director, you know, any of those key positions that are really going to be critical to implementing the project. Because again, if it's a competitive award, then everyone's going to be competing to recruit these staff, get them to sign letter of commit, letters of commitment to say that they'll only work with them. So um, it's kind of competitive on all fronts. And then forming a win winning consortium, you know, there are very few U.S. government-funded projects that are implemented by a single organization. I mean, in all my years of working on business development, I don't think that there's ever been a proposal that it was only the organization I worked for and they didn't have any partners. Because inevitably, there will be some kind of gap, either technically or geographically, um, that that 
prime um, recipient will need to fill. So typically a prime recipient will be responsible for the overall management of the award, management of the funds, um, doing all of the reporting, interacting and keeping USAID up to date. Um, but they will form a team of consortium partners who will deliver collaborati collaboratively deliver the project. Um, and the prime recipient may also select a set of subrecipients to support implementation for specific technical areas, target populations, or geographic zones. And usually we call it a one team approach um, is appreciated by US government, the US government. So that means a one team approach means a streamlined org chart for the project. That, that, pro that org chart is showing all of the staff and all the organizations that are gonna be working on the project. That means that even if you have partners, you're working in one shared project office and your staff are, you know, even if you have a sub partner and that staff person is working for the partner, you're still one team. You're still one team, you know, implementing this project. And then you have your senior management team that will represent all the consortium members. So any way that you can, you know, really bring all your consortium partners together and act as one team, one project, because USAID is not going to want to see, you know, one partner going off and, and doing things and, and hearing about it. They really just want to hear from the prime. The prime is responsible and you really have to work together to be consolidated. Um, because, you know, this approach has a strong potential for effective coordination and cost efficiency. So you really want to show USAID that you're leading your team and that you have, you know, you're using the funds judiciously and you're not wasting anything. So um, some ways to identify a potential partner. So again, researching current implementers with USAID and other donors in your country, in your region, in your technical area, leveraging your network. So again, you know, relationships that you or your employees have with folks at other organizations. You might have former colleagues that now work at a different organization that you might want to partner with. Um, attending industry-sponsored events, um, and this can include, you know, technical working groups, project closeout events, um, you know, anything that like-minded, similar organizations are getting together um, to trade ideas or trade um, information from their current projects. And then again, work with USA.org is a resource resource hub for new, current, and future local and international partners. So um, workwithusa.org um, has a database of partners where they have registered um, to show, you know, where they're working, what technical areas they're working in. And so these are all different ways that you can identify different organizations. Um, and you all might have other ideas. So if you have other ways you've identified partners, you know, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, but, you know, you really have to be strategic about the number of partners you select. Um, again, if the funding ceiling is, you know, $5 million, you know, you're not going to be able to have 10 partners. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll want to be conscientious of how to distribute funds um, to a variety of organizations and you know, we call that kind of a back of the envelope of kind of breaking down, you know, what are the costs, um, where are the funds going to be going, and how many can we actually give to partners? You know, weighing the costs and benefits, um, it could also be a large number of partners can also be burdensome to manage and coordinate. Um, you know, again, the prime recipient is responsible for managing and, and supervising the work of these partners. So if you have two partners versus five, it's going to be easier to manage those two partners because you're going to be able to work with them closer and you'll be more spread out if you're working with five. Um, and it could be an inefficient use of U.S. government resources. So again, you know, when you submit your application and you're showing all of your partners, um, USA might wonder, is it really necessary? 
Is this a good use of funds? Um, it, you know, do the scopes of work make sense? So you have to kind of think about a lot of different things before you start signing on partners. So again, you know, you might bring on a partner for technical assistance, you know, just providing technical support. You might need someone to provide service delivery or actually implement on the ground. Um, or you have resource partners, you know, you might occasionally call upon them, um, but you don't have any formal commitment at the start or during a proposal process. Um, but just really thinking about complementary versus overlapping skills and making sure your scopes of work are very clear and defined so no one's stepping on each other's toes. And you really have to consider, you know, reputation and credibility of the partner. Um, really think about their geographic coverage and presence, their local experience and knowledge of the local context, history of performance with the donor or other donors, you know, that they've implemented well and they've used funds properly, and strategic influence. You know, maybe you, you're bringing on a partner for strategic reasons because they have a good relationship with you know, a stakeholder that's going to be important. So a lot of factors to think about. And then this is a lot of um, information here on, you know, performing the, the project team. So again, identifying the main sectors or programmatic areas of the project and determining which of those would benefit from a product from a partnership. So again, someone that's going to complement your organization's expertise, strengthen your credibility, et cetera. Um, you'll hold, you know, in, initial exploration meetings with new partners, you know, letting them know you're considering an opportunity, what the opportunity is about, and inquiring about their own interest. Um, and you can be direct or subtle, you know, depending on the needs. Um, and if there's mutual interest, you know, that usually leads to exchanging corporate capability statements, you know, selling your organization to them, selling why you would be a good partner to them, either as a prime or a sub. Um, marketing yourselves to partners is really important at this stage. And then, of course, follow-up meetings, you know, you say, yes, we're interested in partnering, so we're going to do a high-level scope of work. We're going to define our roles. Um, at that point, you don't want to detail out too much of your strategy, but you'll want to um, maybe eventually sign a non-disclosure agreement um, that could be included in a pre-team agreement or a teaming agreement. So those those documents um, formalize the partnership, outlines you know your responsibilities for the proposal, what kind of you know scope of work you have, what are the expectations, and that's really important. So again, just a summary of partnership formation. Again, a capability statement is asking for um, capability statement based on the organization's experience in the technical and geographic areas of the potential proposal. Pre-teaming or teaming agreements, they precede the proposal release and articulate the intention of the parties. And it's important to only use a pre-teaming agreement as the final proposal may change. So yeah, a pre-team agreement comes before the actual RFA is released. And then at RFA released, you sign up final teaming agreement. You're probably familiar with those, um, but they just formalize the arrangement, but leaves some room to make changes in case the scope of work of the final project changes. Again, a non-disclosure agreement um, is used to ask a potential partner to sign that so that prevents them from using information you share um, about proposal prep with anyone else. So it's really, you know, a, a, it's a legal, a well-known legal document um, that just says, you know, you're sharing strategic important information and we are not going to share that with anyone else in the scope of work. So designing a scope of work that aligns with the proposal and the organization's capacity statement. So again, making sure that partner is very clear and knows exactly, you know, what their role is on the potential project and how that role is different from the prime or another partner that might be on the team. 
So again, these are um, what are pre teams are for competitive bids. So these are you know executed again pre team agreement executed before the NOFA is released and will be adjusted once the final comes out and contains the scope of work in NBA language. And then again, the final team agreement is executed once it goes live and then offers an opportunity to make adjustments to the scope of work at that time. So, you know, let's say you sign a pre-teaming agreement for a particular technical scope, but that scope has been increased or decreased in the final RFA. And so that scope of work will have to be adjusted. And it's just something that, you know, often happens so um, again, I think I mentioned this before, um, these agreements can be exclusive, i.e. you can agree to be a partner and you're only going to be on that partner's consortium or non-exclusive. Um, you can sign agreements with more than one partner for the same opportunity. Um, but oftentimes, you know, a prime will give a larger scope of work in exchange for ex exclusivity. So it just kind of depends, you know, um, what's most strategic for the prime and what's most strategic for you. Do not share any proprietary or competitive information before the teaming agreement signed. Um, you just don't want to be put in a position where, you know, you're sharing information and someone uses that. Um, and then also, you know, signing these agreements as soon as possible so that you're covered and so you know, you're not waiting to, you know, have important technical or other meetings with um, your prime or your sub partners is really important. And then, you know, once these agreements are in place, you can involve your partners in capture work and project design and then the proposal development process. So, you know, these are just mechanisms that allow you to have agreements in place that will allow you to interact and work together. Okay, and I went through a lot. So we have a second poll that Fikre can launch here. So this one actually only has one question and this is um, coming up to looking forward to our next modules. And the question is what aspects of the application development process are of most concern for you? So what are least concerning one and five most concerning. So we'll give some time for you to put your answers in here. So some of um, the responses, you know, having adequate staff and resources to pull the application together, is that something that's really concerning to you? Be preparing for a bit ahead of release. So knowing, you know, what to do and how to do it before the RFA comes out. Understanding the requirements of the application and how to, you know, put it together for submission. D, designing and explaining the technical approach in your application. And then D, developing the budget to reflect your technical approach. So which of these are the most, most concerning or least concerning? Give about a minute for you all to get your answers locked in. All right, I'm just keeping a watch on the time. So it's looking like having adequate staff and preparing ahead, preparing a bid ahead of release are pretty much neck and neck and, and C as well, understanding the requirements. It seems you all don't have as many concerns about design or developing the budget, so that's good. So I think we can close 
the poll. So yeah, it looks like having adequate staff resources and prepping ahead of bid release are probably the most concerning, um, which is understandable, you know. Um, release dates are constantly changing. Uh, USA will say something's coming in six months and six months gets here and then it's not coming for three more. Um, so it's very challenging. And preparing ahead of time, I think, is all is has a lot to do with that as well. You know, getting partners in place and thinking about how you want to respond based on information you have. So, all understandable. Great, thank you very much. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for participating in that poll. So we will move along. Um, I just want to give maybe five minutes to check in if we have any questions, and then we'll move on to the next module. I know we're going through a lot of information, so I really appreciate your time and attention. And again, we'll be sharing these resources after. Um, so thanks for, for bearing with us. So Mesmi, are there any questions before I move on to the next section? Yes. Um... I think that um, we have uh, some questions related to um, the path of prior process and, and pre-positioning as well. Mm -hmm. And I want to reassure to each of us here in, the, in this uh, training, this webinar, that you will be able to have uh, the resources. So some of the questions you have today, we have answer uh, you know, in the next module or maybe tomorrow. So uh, we have a lot of resources that we are communicating. Just a few questions for you. Um, I think that there's there's some uh, questions related to the fact that some, um, in, in the part of prime process, how far the prime should be involved in 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 in, in the process of uh, building capacity of, of, of sub-partner, uh, how far this can be, can we engage, for example, can the prime be accountable to to certain capacity of 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 human resources for sub? Be sure that they will. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it really depends on your relationship with the prime. Um, you know, some organizations have created kind of long term relationships with INGOs. Um, and you know, maybe even have some sort of, you know, kind of agreements in place to build capacity. Um, I know that, you know, especially around HR and, you know, budgets and financial information, it can be kind of touchy subjects. So you really have to trust and have a good relationship with those, you know, primes or INGO partners to build that capacity. Um, I think, again, you know, using ASAP resources, Using any of the resources that USAID or other you know agencies have provided is really great. I know there's probably also a lot of consultants out there that um, you know can work with organizations to again build their capacity and understand the rules and regulations and policies that need to be in place to implement um, U.S. government and, and receive U.S. government funds. So I think you know, having a few different ways to kind of understand the requirements and, and having someone really dedicated within your organization to understanding and putting these processes in place and working with someone on the outside. And again, having a, a relationship with an INGO um, or, you know, a consultant that can kind of help shepherd you through because, I mean, it's, it's a lot and, and, you know, I've learned a lot over the years, but I, I'm always, you know, really impressed with the organizations that have, you know, um, been able to to receive these funds because the, the U.S. government just wasn't designed, <laughs> didn't design their processes uh, from the get-go to work with local partners. So there's been a lot of learning, I think, on both sides. And I think USAID, you know, can still do more to support local partners, um, you know, to understand requirements and policies and procedures, but I think a lot of that has been done through projects like ASAP and will hopefully continue through the next iteration of, um, I don't think it'll be called ASAP anymore, but there'll be another iteration of a USAID project that will support um, local partners to to become primes. 
Yeah. Um, in, in the solicitation, in pre solicitation process, also, um, do you think international organizations who have a regional office and uh, a country office should they use the same unique identifier to apply, or do they need mm -hmm. to have both or separate? Yeah, I think if. Um... As long as they're not, you know, separate entities, I know some INGOs have created kind of local organizations that are completely separate entities. So they have their own board of directors, they have their own, um, you know, founding kind of documents and policies and procedures. So in that case, you know, if they are in fact two separate organizations, they would have their own um, registration and uh, own UEI numbers. I think, um, but for any, you know, local organization, you know, you'd have your own number. I, I think uh, there's one comment. Um, there's one comment about the the fact that the some partners want to create a WhatsApp group to chat and uh, uh, for with uh, interested participants in this webinar mm -hmm. for networking purposes. So I think. Uh, it's it's over to you to see, but I know that in 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 ASAP we could we created the community of practice, which is a a platform oh. where we allow each and everyone to to share experience and to discuss. Um, maybe in the next, uh, if there's any um uh, let me say any uh platform that will any mechanism that comes in, maybe this can be extended also. But yeah. it's I, I don't know what you think about the the WhatsApp group suggestion and. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think the community of practice that you mentioned, I think there's a few um would be a good place to start. Um, of course, if any of um the partners on the call, you know, want to take that on, I, I don't think that's something that and I can check. I'll check for sure, but I'm not sure that you know, ASAP as the project is coming to a close at the end of October. Um, so I'm not sure that they would be able to host something like that, but I think there is information about the community of communities of practice on the ASAP website. Um, so I would look into those. And like I said, hopefully for the next iteration of, of you know, local partner support projects from USAID, um, hopefully they'll, they'll continue those communities of practice. Yeah. The so last... I'm just, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, we have 30 minutes left today, and I have another module to get through. So I might go ahead and um, proceed, and then we'll have time for Q&A. And if we don't get to everything um, today, we can, you know, we'll have another session tomorrow, and we'll have more time for Q&A tomorrow, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Ms. Me. Thanks, everyone, for those great questions. So like I said, we have one um, more module to get through. And so this is, you know, we have been building up over these last three modules of getting to, you know, finally live proposal kickoff. So this is what, you know, we all wait for, no matter how much preparation we've done, or, you know, we haven't done any and we see something posted on grants, or we learn of something that's come out, you know, this is the time that, you know, is the key, key moment in proposal development. Um, so we really hope in this session, you know, to make you aware of the processes and key tools for project design and proposal development and understanding the requirements and best practices for developing a strong proposal package. So that includes the technical and the cost proposal. And then appreciate the importance of conducting multiple thorough reviews and edits, as well as packaging and submitting the proposal on time. So lots to go through, um, but in this first kind of, we'll, we'll do this module and then we have a couple of more tomorrow that really get into the details of project design and budget development. So um, we'll get into more of those details tomorrow, but today we'll really talk about getting organized, understanding donor and uh, the donor and requirements of the solicitation, having pro a proposal kickoff meeting, and then preliminary, preliminary steps before writing the proposal. So this was just an example. As you can see, this was from three years ago. 
um, the NOVO has been released. So this is just an example of one that was released from USA Zimbabwe. And the button here is keep calm or press this button, panic. You know, that's usually what happens. Even if you've been preparing for six months, the day the proposal is actually released, the solicitation is actually released, still always causes panic because, you know, before you've even, you know, read the the read the um, NOFO that's come out, you're wondering, oh gosh, like, did they change any of the scope of work? How many key personnel do they want? Like, what is the actual budget ceiling that they're giving us? Like, we don't know, you know, so it's all that kind of initial, you know, like, oh my gosh, what's going on? What, what are we going to do? So first things first, you know, don't panic. Hopefully you've been preparing, you know, putting time in to, to getting some things done. And, and But if, if you haven't had the opportunity to do that, you know, the most important, important thing is just to remember that the moment the NOFO, the RFA is released, the clock starts ticking towards that final deadline. So you can see, you know, the example here on the right side, you know, to immediately take note of important dates. So, you know, it came out on March 8th. There's a deadline for questions to the donor. So USAID gives you time to read and then ask questions about anything that's not clear within the NOFO. And then it tells you the final submission deadline and, you know, what time it's due. Um, and other NOFOs, I might tell you dates for to participate in a pre-application or pre-proposal conference. Um, you know, I might give an opportunity, you know, USAID might host something where you can come in person and ask questions or they might give an overview. Um, I don't know really how often that's happening anymore, but it, it happens from time to time. So it's just good to read the information and, you know, take note of these deadlines and, and anything that you need to respond to before the, the deadline. So other key factors of success, you know, it's always, you have to act quickly, um, you know, establish a system for managing the time and tasks, how you're going to keep files and information organized, how you're going to keep version control if multiple people are working um, on different pieces of the proposal. You'll also want to allocate the proper resources for product design and proposal development. So taking that time before you start writing to actually design and, and decide what you're going to present to USAID. You'll also want to plan for quality and compliance reviews. You'll want to streamline coordination and communication, you know, keeping partners, proposal team members, reviewers, um, organization leadership. Everyone will want to know what's going on, who's doing what, what are our deadlines, what do I need to help with? Um, and then posting any job advertisements for positions. Now, again, hopefully you've had a chance to do some pre-recruitment and, you know, you can confirm with the final RFA that your staff are still meeting all the requirements and, and good for the job. But if you haven't, or maybe some of the requirements have changed, you might need to, to re-recruit. So again, there's just a lot that happens in those first couple of days after the NOFO goes live and just to kind of be ready, you know, to kind of think about these buckets of issues. So when you mobilize your proposal team, you know, first things first is identify or recon reconfirm your proposal team members and the reviewers so that everybody knows, you know, what's expected of them. You want to define the roles that are critical for success and how your staff can fill them. And so some of the key functions on a proposal development team include, you know, coordination. So, you know, keeping things and people organized, someone that's going to communicate, um, someone that's going to negotiate with partners. I mean, you know, it might be all one person. There might be different people dividing up these tasks. And then you'll want someone who's really in charge of the technical design. And, you know, we usually call them a technical lead. 
And then support for monitoring and evaluation. You want someone working on the financial, the budget piece and putting the budget together and keeping track of, are we staying within the ceiling? Do we have all the resources that we need to put the project together? And then you'll also want resources for management and staffing, HR recruitment. You know, if you're recruiting staff, you have to give them offers. You have to agree on, um, you know, their compensation packages. So there's just a little bit of everything that gets thrown in. And then finally, you'll want to think about reviewers. So during your proposal development process, who is going to support you in reviewing your technical design? Who, is, who needs to review the budget to make sure that costs are being allocated correctly? And who is going to support with compliance? So who is going to review and make sure that you're meeting all of the requirements that are in the NOFO from USA, that you're not forgetting anything, that you're not putting in too much? Um, so it's important to choose reviewers wisely. Um, and they should be separate from the proposal team because once that proposal team is working and getting in the weeds, it's going to be very difficult for someone working on the technical design to then have an objective review of the technical. You know, they're going to think, you know, of course I did the best, you know, I designed the best project ever, you know, what could be the problem? So having some other folks from outside the proposal process to act as reviewers can be really, really helpful. Again, um, one of the first things I do after an RFA comes out is to put the calendar together. Cause you know, again, from March 8th in this case to April 29th, um, you know, they actually had a pretty good amount of time. Let's see, one, two, three, like almost eight weeks. Um, which is really nice. But, you know, whether you have four weeks or eight weeks, it, it never feels like enough time. So you really just have to create the calendar based on, firstly, the proposal deadline. So what is the final deadline for submission? What is the deadline for questions? And it really needs to be clear and easy to see. You know, I have them have it color coordinated here. You know, anything for partners is in purple, technical is in blue. Just making it easy for everyone on the proposal team to see, you know, what's due by when and by who. Again, building in adequate time for reviews and to incorporate feedback is also really important. So you'll see kind of in blue, there's a technical review one and a technical review two. Um, again, important to build those in and give time for revisions and incorporating feedback. And then having regular, you know, proposal team meetings. So everyone working on the proposal will need to coordinate. And, you know, sometimes it's, you know, okay, you meet once a week or twice a week. I've had other proposals, you know, especially if you're nearing the deadline, you might check in with your proposal team every single day to make sure that things that are, you know, need to happen each day keep moving and you're meeting your deadline. So. Um, the proposal calendar, you know, it's great to have a template of that so you can just easily fill it in um, when the proposal goes live and, and be sure to keep it updated as, um, as the, the time ticks by. So before, you know, jumping in, you know, you really have to understand the solicitation. Um, because if you just kind of jump in and like, okay, we have to design and we have to sign our partners and, you know, but you really have to take it step by step. But first, you know, making sure that you read the entire solicitation. So the solicitation refers to the NOFO, the RFA, or the RFP. And reading, read, reading it really carefully and thoroughly so that you understand, you know, everything that you need to do to comply with donor requirements and deadlines. And it's also important to understand how the frame, how to frame the issue in their program description, scope of work, theory of change. So what is, you know, USAID, what is the donor telling you how they, how they see it, how they want it to be implemented? What are they looking for? What are the criteria? And how do you kind of rework that to reflect back how you, how you would implement the project? Um, and you still want to be um, 
paying attention to eligibility. So to make sure, you know, you're still eligible to apply or if any of that changed. Uh, being very clear on what the evaluation criteria is. So what sections carry the most weight? What are they really basing the evaluation on? And how do you respond to that? Any instructions, you know, page limits, how to submit the final copy, what are the deadlines for questions or submissions, um, the terminology that the donor uses and that you should mirror in your proposal. If the donor is using specific language or specific terms, you really want to be sure that you're reflecting and using that language back in your proposal. You also want to be paying attention to the types of approaches that the donor is seeking and what the required components and sections of the proposal are, supplemental, supplementary materials. Um, you know, it's not just that you're putting together a technical approach and a budget, you know, there's multiple other sections of the proposal that are required. Um, and so again, you know, paying attention to the evaluation criteria, you know, usually the technical approach is worth the most. Um, and then, you know, usually management staffing and then usually organizational capacity. Um, they could also decide to evaluate you know, the monitoring and evaluation plan. They could also ask for, um, you know, a gender, a section on gender. You know, it, it just kind of depends on what that particular mission and project is looking for as to, you know, what they think um, they should be evaluating on. So keeping this in mind, and then usually these evalu evaluation criteria will tell you, okay, we're, we need, probably need to spend the most time on our technical approach because it's worth 50 points. And then, you know, management and staffing is 30 points. So that also needs to get a fair amount of attention and organizational capacity. Um, and these are just some other components or supplemental materials that, you know, a typical USAID proposal might ask for. Um, you know, cover letter, acronyms, table of contents, these are, these make it easy for the evaluators to, you know, navigate your actual proposal volume, an executive summary, again, technical approach, management approach, they'll probably ask for CVs of your key personnel, then they have a, a cost proposal, so a summary and detailed budget, um, and for contracts, a fee schedule or milestone plan, they might ask for a summary of experience. So that might be corporate capabilities or past performance. Um, they also have things called representations and certifications, letters of commitment. I could probably name nine or 10 more things that I've seen asked for in proposals. So, you know, again, just to emphasize, it's not just the technical approach. You have a lot of other things that have to be covered and submitted. And it's important at the outset of your proposal process to identify who is responsible for each of these pieces and the deadline for each of them. Um, and then additional other supplemental materials might include, <coughs> excuse me, again, a, a monitoring evaluation and learning plan. They could ask for a gender equality and social inclusion plan an environmental medication and management plan, branding and marketing plan. Um, you know, it just really depends on how detailed and how much information the mission uh, wants at the time of proposal submission. So again, resources to help with these com components can be found at workwithusa.org. They have a resource library, and there's also answers to frequently asked questions about proposal sections in the FAQ portion of that website. So that's a great uh, resource. So please um, visit workwithusaid.org. Um, can really help in that straight from USAID, straight from the donor. And so another tool that I really like to use um, that I hope other people have, um, have used is a compliance matrix. So it's used to capture and communicate the most important information from a solicitation. So this is a really a 
a template and a document that helps kind of distill down, you know, perhaps an RFA or a NOFO is, you know, 100 pages long. And of course, you know, you need to read every page and you'll have to read it at least a couple of times. But the nice thing about a compliance matrix is that it just kind of breaks down the major things that everyone working on the proposal needs to know, you know, breaking down the deadlines, proposal specific information. So, you know, what is the page limit? You know, what kind of font is required? What kind of margins are required? How do you submit it? Who do you submit it to? Um, you know, just all the instructions that you need to follow to submit a compliant proposal. And then having that proposal um, evaluation criteria up front so that everybody knows, okay, this is what we're being scored on. This is how we're being scored and how much it's worth. Um, it's really important to keep top of mind as you're putting these proposals together. So compliance matrix, um, it's a template. So this is just the first page of that template, um, but the subsequent pages kind of breaks down, you know, what is required within the technical approach for the management and staffing. So highly recommend using this um, if you haven't already. Um, and as you can see, like I said, the subsequent pages, you know, it tells you everything that you need to put in the cover page. Um, table of contents, you know, it gets really down to all the details, you know, page limits on those sections, who's responsible for putting them together or writing them. Um, and so it's just really helpful to distill this information all coming from the solicitation, um, but just in a more digestible and like easy to reference form, because you might find information um, you know, the evaluation criteria isn't till page 90, but all the instructions on what to put into the proposal are on page, you know, 30. So it's it's much easier to kind of see it all together in this smaller document. And so another thing, you know, after a solicitation comes out, you know, understanding if there's other additional approvals that you need to move ahead. Um, if there's any been any changes in the NOFO and the scope of work and the dollar value and the requirements, anything that would make your organization reconsider or have to re um, reconfigure anything in order to move forward. So once you've read the solicitation and you have a good sense of you know what the donor is looking for, um, your proposal manager or whoever is responsible for coordinating. Um, should circulate the opportunity to leadership and other decision makers. You might need to schedule a meeting to discuss anything um, of why the opportunity is important or, or you know, to read, reconfirm your go decision. You might, you know, be asked to estimate the cost of preparing the proposal. So it's not just, you know, putting time together, but it's, you know, how many folks do you have working on the proposal? Does anyone need to travel? You know, what, you know, how much time is putting the proposal together going to take away from other work that your staff are doing? Um, and, you know, if something big has changed or, you know, the priority for your organization has changed or maybe something in the scope of work that you thought you would be doing is totally different, you might have to pivot and instead, or instead consider a sub role, you know, if, if something significant has changed. Or maybe, you know, you decide that, you know, we don't actually have the resources together now to put this together. So we have to say no. Those are hard decisions to make. Um, but again, it's about prioritizing and, and doing what's best for your organization. Um, and so these are just some considerations, you know, that I'm sure you've all been, been part of before. And so, you know, having the kickoff meeting, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, but you'll really want to get the proposal team and those reviewers, hopefully, um, in one place to kind of introduce everybody, make sure everybody knows what their role and their functions, and then kind of recapping the basics about the proposal, you know, title, donor, geography, award value, et cetera. Hopefully you'll have your proposal calendar done before you have the kickoff meeting so that you can go through that calendar with everyone on the call and point out the important deadlines and go through any, um, you know, you know, changing any of the deadlines or schedules. 
going through the compliance matrix also helps a lot to emphasize the proposal valuation criteria, um, having any initial discussions on the budget to assure alignment. And then, you know, you could brainstorm pri relevant prior experience and how to build on that. You can also talk about wind themes for your proposal. Hopefully you've, you've um, identified wind themes before, but those are kind of the the earworms, the you know, thread that you're going to keep putting through your proposal of why your team is the best for the donor choose, and then identifying any knowledge gaps and plan how to fulfill how to fill them. So if you need desk research or someone needs to travel to a particular region to get information. Um, or you need a partner to fill in something that will also kind of be important to identify at that time. And then, you know, again, re reconfirming, reviewing your partnership configuration. So identifying any experience or expertise gaps, maybe that are new. Um, discuss and finalize your partnership strategy and plan for any outreach to new partners. You might have to add or drop partners, um, depending on if something has changed in the solicitation, the, the piece of work that you were going to give a partner is no longer applicable. So you don't need them, you know, you don't need them on your team anymore. Of course, this is very delicate and requires diplomacy and sensitivity. And, you know, it happens all the time. Um, so it's not that out of the ordinary, but you just don't want to do any harm to your relationships with partners if you're removing them from your consortium. Um, again, revise scopes of works and, and budgets, ex execute the teaming agreements, and then keeping partners informed of the you know proposal process. So what do you need them to, when do you need them to provide a budget? When do you, do you need them to provide written inputs? Do you want them to participate in the technical design? Um, just really keeping partners informed up front and letting them know all of this. And so again, recruitment, you know, you might need to do some rapid recruitment if anything has changed, if there's new um, roles that have been identified in the solicitation. Um, but again, key personnel are usually specified in the NOFO. And so if you've already initiated recruitment, um, it's just really important to confirm the availability of those candidates to let them know that the you know solicitation has come out and that they still you know meet the requirements and if they don't meet the requirements letting them know that they don't so that you can you know let them go and and recruit other folks to fill in gaps and so you know for proposal writing you know there's a few things to do really before you start writing the proposal I know it's a it's a desire to really get in there and get going. Um, but in your kickoff meeting, you know, identify any information gaps, begin research immediately just in case, you know, you're missing any relevant information or facts or figures, and use this time for the organization to engage with the community. So you might, you know, have focus group discussions or meetings with communities that you're working with or in the geographic area that you're dealing with. Um, and just to make sure that those interventions and the design is grounded um, in the context and that it meets the needs of those particular folks that you're going to be working with. And again, asking consortium members to write different technical sections. It always helps to have your partners writing and contributing and helping you. Um, so again, executing teaming agreements. Um, I think we've gone over this, so I'll kind of move forward. And then asking, you know, preparing questions to the donor. This is probably one of the more, more important parts of the process. You know, usually USAID gives you a week or two to read the read the solicitation and come up with your questions, and they'll give you a deadline. And so once all the questions have been submitted and answered, they will post those publicly. So they'll post them back on grants.gov. Um, and so you really should submit questions during this time and just have a designated point person to ensure that you're um, getting those questions to the donor on time and that they're checking. Um, and just be aware that all the questions and answers will be made public 
to everyone else bidding. So you want to be strategic and and um, judicious about what kind of questions you're asking and, and you know, framing them in a way, um, some key considerations, framing the questions in a way that will be clear to the donor and make it easy for them to answer. And keep in mind, you know, not to ask, ask any questions that might reveal your technical approach or your strategy. You know, you don't want to ask USA if they want to see a certain kind of approach because then everyone else will see that they'll say yes or no. So we just want to be careful. Um, and you want to think about when you're putting these questions together, could the donor answer a question in a way that will be helpful? So you really want to frame your question so that USA can easily say yes or no. Or you want to drive them, you know, to answer it in a way that will be helpful to you. So there's a little bit of art to it. Um, and then really consider, do you need to ask a question? Is it really important that you know the answer or can you assume and proceed, you know, cautiously? So, um, and making sure, you know, after you, the, for, the solicitation is released that um, USAID will issue the Q&A, they might issue other amendments extend, extending the deadline. So you wanna make sure that you have registered to get updates um, about that particular solicitation or make sure that um, you're checking every day, someone is checking every day. So I know we've come to the end, it's 10.59 here. So I know we have maybe a minute left. Um, I guess I'll check with Mesmi if there's any questions I can, question I can quickly answer. Otherwise, we'll start the next session tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. And I hope to see all of you there. And we'll have more time for Q&A at the end of tomorrow's session. So I hope you can join us tomorrow if I didn't get to your question today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I think uh, it has been very, very informative. We 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 had some not question that we would we think that we we'll st we start tomorrow and okay. and open and have opportunity for people to 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 ask more question because it's a lot of information to digest. I hope that yeah. today we have information to uh, any question. Please don't hesitate to to come tomorrow uh, with those questions for Rebecca to address. That is a few words that I have. Thank. You very much. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Mesby. Yeah, if I didn't, if you had some questions, we can start tomorrow's session um, with Q&A. And then, like I said, we'll have um, longer time for Q&A at the end of tomorrow's session. So thank you all so much for joining today. I hope to see many of you back tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.